We're about to start with our keynote speech. Otto has been involved with the open source community for years, and he's, if not a pioneer, then at least one of the very early participants in uh, the movement that we're all trying to be right now. So I'm sure we'll all have something very interesting to learn. And here's Otto. Please give him a welcome. Hello, everybody. Do we have sound on? Yes. All right. So I'm Otto, and I'm going to tell you about collaboration, because that's what open source is actually all about. It could be maybe named collaboration source or something like that. And I'm the CEO for the MariaDB Foundation. So I'm going to also have some... My view to this is going to be some practical examples from MariaDB development. But actually, I've also been involved in lots of other open source projects. So I have a nice overview of how this goes in practice for like 15 years. All right. But before I go into open source, I want to set the setting here. So what's, what, why is this important? So I have a question to you. What is the competitive advantage that we as a species have, which makes us better than all the other animals and brought us to the point that we have basically conquered the entire planet and built it and we control everything? We might destroy also everything, but anyway. So it's not, it's not because we are walking on two feet or that would be fast runners. Jeopards are, were certainly in the old Africa faster running than us. It's not because we have great vision, we have a good vision, but there's lots of birds that have a much better eyesight than what we have. It's not because we have a thumb we can, and, and we can use tools. There's also other animals that use tools and that, that can do lots of stuff with their body. It's not the innovation of fire. That's, of course, gave us an advantage, but that's not the crucial thing that I'm thinking about. And it's not... Does anybody have a suggestion what it could be? <laughs> Yes, yeah, smartphones. We didn't have them in the beginning. <laughs> That's the result. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, language is quite close if I heard somebody yelling it. So, so yes, of course. Uh, so, language is some... So, brain size. So, in the beginning, our brain size wasn't the biggest. It evolved to become the biggest, and the, something, something drove, drove the evolution that our brain got bigger. And if you compare to some other animals, for example, certain whales and dolphins, they have a much bigger brain, both absolutely and relatively to body size. And then language is another thing that's already close what I'm thinking of. But actually, many animals have certain kind of languages. And for example, again, dolphins and whales, they can speak from high, big distances of several kilometers underwater. They can hear each other, and they seem to have a quite complex language. But the thing what we have is symbols. So we can produce in our language, we can describe something how something looks and where it is. And for example, I can describe that I found this food that tastes good and seems to be having good nutri nutrition. And you can all go to this and this place by this mountain and then go down this hole and there you can find this food and eat it and it's safe. This is very complex information that we can do because we can convey these symbols from our brains to some other, some other person's brain. And if you think about human history, so we've, we've had a complex language for a long time. 
And then when you think about the her word history, we divide it into historic times and prehistoric times. So the, the point where it turns from prehistoric to historic is defined by the fact that you can find writings from the time. For the time you can't find writings is prehistoric, and from the point on when you can find some writings, it's called the historic time. So the ability to write something down was, was very good. So in addition to telling something to somebody who can tell it forward, we can also write down something and then somebody can later read it. And that makes it possible to transfer information over a great distance and also over a great time. I can, for example, or somebody 500 years ago could have written down something and I could read it, it now, if it's the same language and so on, but in theory. For, so it was not... And, and writing, of course, is immensely more accurate than just telling people from mouth to mouth some information. And then we have great steps in how the writing system developed. And when, we, when Gutenberg invented printed press, the whole Western society kind of jumped in big leaps and we had the, we came out of the dark middle ages and we got a new scientific period and people got information about all kinds of things when up to that point the church and monasteries and monks controlled basically copying information and books. And, and then in the 1900s we got the radio and television which made that we can broadcast information and symbols very quickly worldwide. And now the latest leap of course is the invention and, and proliferation of internet that's everywhere that we can now do the communication in two ways. And in this environment it's very exciting, at least for me, to participate in open source development because it wouldn't obviously have been possible ever before. So now we can live in the situation that we have some problem and we can solve it in software and then somebody can start, start writing a solution to that problem and then publish it and then basically anybody around the world can come in and comment on that or improve on it and, if, and certain projects have have the kind of critical momentum that they come widely known and used in a lot of places and they also get a lot of a lot of people collaborating and testing out and then contributing so if you are working in a big open source project you have fairly good confidence that what you are doing is the the best possible solution available in humanity at the time so i i know some very intelligent people who are working with artificial intelligence and working in closed source places and sometimes they make very great advances but most of the time they are kind of deprived of the feedback and new ideas and new innovation so when you do it in the open you can stand on the shoulder, shoulders of a giant and kind of ben you, your work benefits entire mankind, but potentially also anybody in the, of the mankind can, can benefit your work. All right, so then to the open source topic more deeply. So I am, I am the CEO for the MariaDB Foundation, which is funded by the MariaDB Corporation. So these are two different entities and then some other companies like Booking and WordPress.com that are heavy users of MariaDB. And the point why a MariaDB Foundation exists is to guarantee continuity and open collaboration. And those who know the story of MySQL and MariaDB know that there was a kind of a hiccup in the continuity some years ago. <coughs> So now that in future it's not, it should not be possible for a big corporation to buy the project because the foundation has all the relevant technical assets to make new releases and, 
and also all the copyright and, and immaterial rights needed to continue the license, to, to continue the project. And the foundation has six people working, and one of them is Monty Videnius, who is the original author of MySQL and MariaDB. And, and we don't do any bespoke development. Nobody can buy anything from the foundation. We just choose what is the best things to do for the general public, and then we focus on those, those tasks. For example, porting and packaging, which makes MariaDB available to more and more people and platforms. And it's obviously the single point of collaboration for anybody who wants to develop the MariaDB code base. And uh, even if you don't do much, the fact that you are a single point of contact means that that's, it, that's a point where people can gather to and collaborate. Right, so it's all about open collaboration to be inclusive and enable that everybody can participate and contribute. That's why we're separate from the company because the company staff has other priorities and they need to stress about sales and stuff like that, which we don't need to care about. We just exist to be the place for collaboration. All right, so this is open source. So just a quick recap of what the principles in open source and free software is. They are, they are the same. They are synonyms in, in practice. They all, as any license that is open source is also free software. But I, I like to use the term open source because there's less people who misunderstand what it means. So the definition of open source, it has four things that need to apply. The first is the freedom to use, that you can get the software and you can use it freely without any restrictions of if it's commercial or non-commercial or what country you are in or, or what religion you have or whatever. There can be no restrictions. Then you need to have a freedom to study. There is no no laws or no, no, no license clause that forbid you from studying how the software works. And in practice, to be effective in studying how the software works, you need to have the source code, obviously, so you can read the code. Then you need to have the freedom to improve, which means that you need to have the freedom that you can <coughs> make new versions of the software, and you need to have the freedom to redistribute either the original software or the modified one that you've improved, whatever you want. So all of these freedoms need to apply. If, they, if, if even one of those fail, then the license is not open source. And note that these are all freedoms. They are not obligations. So open source is about enabling that something can happen, but it doesn't guarantee that it happens. There are no obligations that something must happen. <clears throat> so it's, it's important to understand that this is a kind of a strategic thing to choose the license for your software or, or how you do things. It's like open source versus closed source is like democracy versus totalitarianism. So in some cases, the totalitarianism can work very well, but in the long run, you probably don't want to have it anyway, because it can also work very badly. It can go to the extremes. And, and open source gives you the freedom that, that is quite similar to democracy. It doesn't mean that that certain party that, that has the power in a democratic country, that it would be the best possible party and always make the right decisions, but at least it means that there's freedom to change the party and change the policies if they don't work well. And open source, I think it's important to understand that it's a strategy. It doesn't guarantee that the end result is good. It doesn't guarantee anything about the execution. So, 
but you cannot execute well if you don't have the correct strategy in software development. And of course, when I talk about collaboration, open source in software is the requirement that collaboration can happen without open source and proper open source and using licenses that actually give all, the, all these four freedoms, you are not likely to have collaboration. And For example, I've seen many times some closed source company that they have a closed source product and it's not going very well for that and they're not selling it much and then they decide to open source it. So most of these cases it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go well because the strategy is maybe correct at that point but the execution has already gone bad for a long time ago so nobody will come up and even if, you clean, even if you open source your software, it won't attract people who suddenly come up and fix your bugs and clean up your code. That doesn't work. You need to, when you have an open source, you, you need to have the process going on for a long time to have the benefits happen. And also, lots of people who do open source and especially all the projects that are in the beginning, they usually work quite alone. It takes some time for somebody to come and participate. So it's important to understand it's not... It, it doesn't mean that somebody wants to be your slave and then start help you just because you have open source license in your software. So the motivation is something else and you need to understand it's always about giving and getting something. So and that's actually the definition of collaboration, that you give and get something. There are at least two parties that give something to each other. You give, if you are the maintainer of an open source software, you give them a solution to some problem that they solve in, with your software, and they give back something to you in, in return. All right, so what forms of contributions are there? It's not just about the code. The code is obviously the, the most explicit one, but also merely having feedback from somebody of, of, some, of if your software works or doesn't work or how it could work better, that helps you improve it. And uh, of, in software development, Testing, for example, is a very big part. It's hard to do well and it's hard to automate. And the fact that you have a lot of people using your software is a good testing process in itself. And then, for example, translations. Few closed source software have as much translations as the open source, soft, big open source softwares have. So that's very common for open source software that if it gets popular, then people around the world are starting tra to translate it into different languages so that it's more convenient for the fellow countrymen of that person to use it after that. And documentation, obviously, and documentation done by somebody else than the original developer is usually much better. And documentation is also good for the person who is writing that documentation because they they, they benefit a lot of the, it themselves that they have the documentation available and they can trust the software much more and use it, implement it more in their systems. And of course, graphics and design, it's often overlooked, but that's an important part also of contributions and, and marketing and advocacy in general. And in the Linux ecosystem, Packaging the software and distributing it into Linux distributions is also an important part of the, of the ecosystem because otherwise you will have much less users of your software. And every time you use some software, 
and you come across a bug and you report it, if you report it properly, then you are doing a very valuable contribution. So please continue writing bug reports and try to write them as well as possible. And in MariaDB, I did a little check in the Git log about who is contributing code, and there's a lot of, lot of people. There are private people, and then there are people who's working for big enterprises and companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter and so on. So when you think about why these persons are contributing, some are contributing because the employer wants them to contribute, some are private persons, some are academics who contribute because they solve some, something in their own life. So think about who, who your contributors are and what they do is obviously important. Understand that they are not slaves who come there just because they want to sub submit themselves to your, you and start working whatever you want. They only do stuff that they have some benefit in themselves. They are always scratching their own itch. I like this term a lot. So for example, <clears throat> let's say somebody in a web hosting company is using MariaDB and then they come across a bug and then they file the bug and nothing maybe happens because the bug might be difficult to reproduce or it might be difficult to fix or it's not, it, it might be something that other people are not experiencing. So then the web hosting company might decide that, hey, that this needs to be fixed and we have some people who have extra time and they have the skills to write the code and then they investigate and they fix it and they make a patched version of MariaDB and start using that instead and then the thing is sold for the company. So why does the company then decide that their employees need to spend more time and submit the patch back upstream? Well, the reason is quite simple because every, uh, with regular intervals there are new versions of MariaDB coming out and if you maintain your own patches then you need to apply them on every release. So it's much easier to submit them to the project and then you don't need to apply them anymore because all the new releases already contain it. And it might be that your fix is not very good and when you send it to the project somebody else will see the exact solution and then figure out, figure out the way to make it even better. And it might be that in five years some architectural change will, will do something that impacts the patch and then somebody else might do the entire fix so your company doesn't need to take responsibility of maintaining that patch forever. So that's important to understand that it's not about, it's not about uh, volunteer work. It might be to some people because they think it's fun, but most the bulk of the hard work is done by people and companies who are solving their own problems. And they participate because they participate in collaboration, which is that they get something out of it and they give back because if they don't give then they don't get the new releases with those patches inside. Right, so here's some practical examples. You can't see all of this but this is a screenshot from GitHub, a pull request and this guy, we don't know who he is, we just see his GitHub handle and we might know his name, but we might not know who is his, who is his employer and, and if he is doing this just for himself or for some larger group of people. But he have noticed that <coughs> there was some problem in, in compiling MariaDB and Mac OS X Yosemite version. So then he debugged what the problem was and found a solution and then sent a pull request that please include this and after that this same person will have the benefit that in new MariaDB versions they will compile correctly. So completely selfish, selfish reason. And here is somebody else sending in a simple pull request 
regarding fixing spelling mistakes. So it's somebody who's native English speaker and he probably got annoyed by some spelling mistakes and then he set, sent in a patch to fix it. And here is a translation example. Here is in Debian the installer. <coughs> Somebody is using it in Portugal or in, in Brazil actually. And then <coughs> somebody who speaks English in Brazil and using MariaDB decided that he wants to translate it. We have no idea is it, why, he, why he did it, but I'm sure that he has some kind of selfish reason or that he's helping his department or something like that so that other people can easily install MariaDB using Brazilian Portuguese after that. <coughs> and here's a, a developer meetup we had a few weeks ago in Amsterdam. And I think that most of the people who attended, th those people we got, got to learn about. So they, most of the people worked for some company that does some cloud service or something, and they use MariaDB for the database, and then they participate to influence the direction where the project is going. So people are helping you because of selfish reasons. They, they know that when they collaborate, they get something out of it. So you have to consider that <coughs> you have to make it as easy as possible to collaborate. So the, the lower the barrier to collaboration is, the more likely you are, get, you are to get contributions because even small benefits coming back to the contributor will outweigh the effort they needed to take to send you the contribution. So you need to focus on keeping the contribution cycle as simple as possible. And I really like GitHub because the pull requests are so damn easy to do in GitHub compared to the old way when you sent with patches on mailing lists and stuff like that. Of course, GitLab, GitHub is not the only service you can also use. For example, GitLab that has this merge request feature, which is the simil similar. And <clears throat> I had yesterday a workshop about Git, and that's also a very important part, I think, in open source project, because Git makes tracking changes and and uh, branching and then merging back, it makes it so easy that, that it's, it's very low effort in, kind of in the overhead of managing the contribution. So even small things are, are worth fixing because the overhead is so small. <coughs> so here is, this, ac this example is from Docker where I made a pull request on Docker, and they have a very, very, very smooth system to accept contributions. So they have all this continuous integration integrated into their pull requests, and, they, and it tests not only that the test suite passes, but also that the git commit and message and copyright attribution and everything is correct. And then they have a person who gives feedback about that, and then they have two persons who, who accept, who give their comment on the substance of the technical contribution, and if you get two people who say it's okay, then your contribution is merged. And I think Git, I mean, uh, Docker has like 30,000 pull requests in, on GitHub. So that's... They have very good workflow on that, and that I think that's probably one of the reasons why they get so, so, lot, so many contributors. This is from the screen. <laughs> All right. So you can't force anybody to contribute to your project, but you can make it as easy as possible and as inclusive as possible. So if you're not inclusive, then you are closed or working in, in secrecy or something. You shouldn't do that. You should be as inclusive as possible. 
so that if somebody wants to contribute, it will be easy. So one obvious thing is to do is to have your version control in public and publish all the commits as they come in real time. There are other projects that only make code dumps at release time. So they are fully open source and the end result is open source, but the, they have a closed development cycle and they only dump their source code at the end. So don't do that. Nobody wants to collaborate with a project that the development is hidden. And then also, besides the code, you also need to have discussions publicly so that people can chip in and say their opinions and say what they would like to have on the roadmap and stuff like that. Obviously, if you have a big development team and you have an office and stuff, then your developers will be talk to each other in this office and have lots of discussions that are not public. But then you should remember to always send some summaries and keep, up, keep also the public discussion on mailing lists alive. If you have a company that's distributed around the globe, globe, then it's more natural that you just say your developers that, that communicate on this public mailing list and then it's automatically solved this inclusiveness in the planning process. Then it's also good to have some chat channel because some people don't like to write emails, they rather chat, so have that. And chats are also a good way to have meetings online. And obviously, some people don't like either mailing list or chat, or they, need, they, they are afraid to go there initially. So also, you need to have face-to-face -face meetings where people can get to know each other. And then after that, they, it's much easier for them to participate in the discussions. And then obviously you need to have a public bug tracker because otherwise you will not get bug reports and you need to keep the work of solving the bug also public so that the people, the person who originally reported the bug can chip in and give more debug information and also that other people who are experiencing the same bug can perhaps come in and help with solving it. And then of course, what's very important and what we focus in in the MariaDB Foundation is that we have staff that keep an eye on all incoming pull requests and all patches to bug reports and then review those as quickly as possible. Because that means if somebody's submitting you code, it means that they have already invested quite a lot of time. And if the code is good, then you really want to be nice to that person because they are then giving you something very valuable that it could take many hours or days for yourself to produce. And then not, don't forget documentation. I know some open source projects that, that, that keep their documentation either completely secret, that it's only available some, to some certain persons, or then they just publish the end result, but they don't develop the documentation online. And documentation is something that I don't think that any contributor will directly jump into code or quite seldom somebody will directly jump into contributing code. They probably first want to understand the project and how the code works and everything, and they might contribute to documentation first just to make it clearer for, for themselves and others and get kind of, when they publish new documentation, they can get feedback that if it was actually correct and have they understood and found the correct information. Right, so you start with a small project and then if you're lucky, it will grow big. And then the question is, how do you manage collaboration in a big project? with like millions of lines of codes. MariaDB has two, millions, two million lines of code and like 20,000 files. So what do you do then? How do you manage it? Well, the answer is that you don't. If you, you can't manage a big project. So what you need to do is you need to split it into smaller parts. 
because humans can't, it, it just, you can try managing it, but you will never success. You need to simplify things. If they get big, then you simplify. So for example, if you, it's kind of a visualization that in this one picture, you have a central point and then you have 12 lines going to other points and then managing all the communication and, and dependencies and everything between those components requires a lot of work and you will never be able to keep up with that properly. So you need to then abstract and make interfaces and stuff and split up the project into sub-components or something else so that you get into a manageable amount of, of interactions. Instead of 12, four is much better, that's one third. So, code-wise, think about interface, interfaces and APIs. Try to modularize everything. It's also much easier for some new contributor to come in that instead of trying to understand all the two million lines of code, all they need to understand is the code in a single plugin or in a single module. And once they understand that, they can do a meaningful contribution and they don't need to spend any more time knowing what the rest of the two million lines of code do. And the idea with an interface is that you, it, it's a contract. It, it has some documentation that says that this interface does this and this. And then behind the interface, you don't need to care about anything. Think about, for example, if you go to a toilet and wash your hands, you just turn on the water, you can you can choose on or off, and you can choose warm or cold, and then you can wash your hands, but you don't need to think anything about how the pipes go behind the wall or how the boiler works and where the water comes from. And also the person who designed the toilet doesn't need to think about how people wash their hands, they just say that here is the water and here you can do it how, how you like it. And then when you make these promises about how your interfaces work, you also need to get, get, give some promises of the time frame of how long you plan to maintain them. And if you release new versions, please use semantic versioning. That means that you have major versions like 1.0, and then you have mi minor versions like 1.1, and then you have micro versions like 1.0.1. And in a micro version, the changes are very small, and in a minor version, you might add some new features, but not break backwards compatibility. And if you need to break backwards compatibility, then you should use a major new version number. This is the kind of a industry strand standard in version, version numbers of what they mean. And I know that some companies even organize themselves that inside the companies they have teams and the teams have stated in contracts what their interfaces are to other teams, both in code and in, in the thing that they do between humans in the company. So you can't manage complexity, you can only manage simple things and the idea is how to make complex things into simple. Yeah. So about being inclusive, here is the MariaDB bug tracker. It's on Jira and it's completely public. All the bugs are public and also all the information about the bugs, who is working on them and what comments have been said and what's the target milestones and so on, they are all public. And this is very good for collaboration. And here is the mailing list. Anybody can subscribe to it and anybody can read the archives and anybody can say something if they want to. And there are also specific outreach projects that help you get more contributors. For example, Google Summer of Code is a great example of Google who is sponsoring students that if they want to work on an open source project, then they get a mentor who will help them from the project and Google is sponsoring this activity. All right, so this was the basic rules for collaboration. So what are, what problems can you have? And obviously, 
one of the big problems is that you get too much collaboration. Too many people are interested in your project, and then they just create noise, and it might be hard to find what are the actual contributions that you want to have. So what you want to have is kind of talented people making good contributions and not just people filing bugs on your bug tracker, which are actually support requests and, you, and there's not much you can do on, or if you, there's nothing you can do in the code to solve that or, or the impact if you just start helping sing, single, single individuals will be low. So the solution to this, I think, lies somewhere in continuous integration that, for example, in the pull request example I showed, there is automatic testing using, for example, Travis CI, which is free for open source projects. And in MariaDB, we have this custom build bot system that runs a lot of tests on, on the code. So you can use this to automatically test all incoming contributions and patches to see if they at minimum work. And if you, if you find a problem that the computer can spot automatically, then the computer can report back to that person that your contribution is not good enough. Please, please keep working on it. And no human needs to spend time on it, on reviewing it, until it passes at least the automatic tests first. And then the big opportunity, why you, do, why you want to have a collaboration is I like this phrase a lot. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So basically it comes back to what I said in the beginning. If you have a problem in the real world and you can make a solution for it using software, then if you do it in the public, you potentially have the best solution in the world because other people who want to, who have the same problem in their own situations will then try to solve it and then contribute to the process and then you have a kind of an evolution that, that's, that the solution gets better and better the more people use it and the more people contribute to it. And don't forget that collaboration is also fun. So doing it alone or in a small team in a company using some closed source stuff, it's, it gets boring quite quickly. But when you do it in the public and you do it open source, you have a lot of open source conferences and meetups and it's much more fun and it's really great to wake up in the morning and open your email and you see some person from some remote university who has, who has a new solution to something and it's very exciting. And in general working in software is really cool because if you think about the symbols I, I talked about in the beginning so they are kind of a way to extend our memory beyond our brain. So even when we write up something, we don't need to remember it anymore. And it's very accurate, and then we can put it back into our memory by reading it from the paper. Or we can give it to somebody else who can then read it and get the information into their head. And I think that software is so exciting because it's basically about outsourcing your thinking not just the memory, but the thinking process out of your brain, and you express it by writing some kind of code. Actually, it can be software code, but it could even be some kind of policy or law or some other kind of code that codifies human behavior or some process. You write it out into code, and then you have a process that's stored somewhere, and then you can take that process and run it somewhere. And then that that process can be improved and improved and improved, and it will rapidly accelerate the entire mankind how we develop forward. Thank you. So I, I already used my time, but yes, do you have any we wouldn't quick have questions? Time. Only if it's really, really quick. Nobody dares do it. <laughs> so uh, let's thank Otto once more.
Um, find him, talk to him if you want uh, here or at the after party. And right now, uh, I urge you to stay in your places because we have a closing ceremony. And if I may invite the team to enter. Or not. Magic. While the team is walking here, I would like to thank all the organizers that this has been a really great event. And it's, I'm very glad to see so many people here and so many people who are excited about what they're doing. That's very important. <laughs>